and gentlemen, thanks for joining the Emphasis Q4 FY 2024 Earnings Conference Call. I am Zico Pereira, your moderator for the day. We have with us today Mr. Nitin Rakesh, CEO of Emphasis, and Mr. Manish Duggar, CFO. As a reminder, there is a webcast link in the call in white mail that the Emphasis management team would be referring to today. The same presentation is also available on the Emphasis website, www.emphasis.com. In the investor section under the financial and filing as well as on both the BSE and NSE websites. Request you have the presentation handy. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. Before we begin, I would like to state that some of the statements made in today's discussion may be forward-looking in nature and may involve certain risks and uncertainties. A detailed statement in this regard is available in the Q4 results release that has been sent out to all of you earlier. I now hand over the floor to Mr. Nitin to begin the proceedings of this call. Thank you, and over to you, Nitin. Thank you, Zico, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I uh, appreciate your interest in emphasis, and I know it's early morning. Uh, I trust everyone's had a chance to review our earnings release documents. Uh, I'd like to start by discussing macro trends as always, uh, and then we'll double click on the emphasis performance numbers. Uh, as we've been calling out for, for a few quarters now, the market continues to be characterized by duality. On one hand, the global business world is dealing with an unprecedented situation of high interest rates, supply chain woes, labor market dislocations, record inflation, and a fragile geopolitical environment. Consequently, the level of uncertainty in the environment stays high, leading to a high degree of indecision on investment decisions, keeping pressure on discretionary spends. On the other hand, full technological advancements and increased focus on sustainable practices are some trends that have the potential to change how businesses operate. Worldwide, IT spending is expected to total $5 trillion in calendar year 24, an increase of 6.8% from 2023, according to the last forecast by Gartner, who also states that IT services will continue to see an increase in growth in 2024, becoming the largest segment of IT spending for the first time. This is largely due to enterprises investing in organizational efficiency and optimization projects. These investments will be crucial during this period of economic uncertainty. We now are seeing new pockets of spend opening up in organizations that are looking to invest in modernizing legacy systems, leveraging AI and automation to improve operational efficiency. Efficiency and cost optimization plays are gaining traction as organizations look to find short-term wins to fund longer-term technological priorities. As Gen AI dominates discussions on tech spend, its increasing adoption will spur additional growth. In our conversations with customers, we continue to see them trying to balance cost savings priorities in the current micro environment with the need to stay relevant, tech forward, and competitive. As we advise our clients, we also continue to evolve internally to stay ahead of the curve as technology adoption rapidly changes. The market continues to evolve and at a rapid pace. There is a need for service providers to go beyond the current and not just apply AI. Our ability to orchestrate the ecosystem by bringing in technology and people together to solve for customer needs strongly positions us in this tech-first environment. At Emphasis, as every tribe was getting AI enabled, we now see our solution and deal archetypes getting rapidly supercharged. We have been investing to stay ahead, of, ahead through an AI-led archetype approach. Our prominent AI partnerships across hyperscalers and the overall ecosystem is seeing rapid growth and solving for customer needs. To quote a few examples, we were recently engaged in an AI-driven IT production support engagement to improve reliability and uptime for a top three U.S. bank. We helped accelerate claims processing efficiency by 85% for a large benefits admin provider using an AI-driven zero-touch approach. We also helped set up an AI security platform based on zero-trust principles for a Canadian healthcare provider. If you recall, Emphasis was one of the first to create an AI business unit called Emphasis.ai. We've been working with our customers to build a point of view, helping them think through their AI journey on productivity and, and consumer experience, 
and we've now evolved to modernization as well. Modernization is one of the bigger opportunities, and we have developed an archetype that is now enabled by Gen AI-centered platforms. We are starting to see every archetype from customer experience transformation to productivity, modernization, or zero-cost tra transformation being AI-enabled. Tech providers and the market is moving rapidly. We are invested in continuous development of the ecosystem to stay ahead of the curve in our ability to orchestrate tech, people, services, uh, especially in the ecosystem of the market with AWS, Microsoft, and Google. We recently announced a strategic collaborative agreement with AWS focused on Gen AI in financial services. Emphasis will also set up a Gen, Gen AI foundry to develop POCs for industry-specific use cases. Similarly, Google recognized us for our deep engineering capabilities. We recently built a hybrid multi-cloud operating platform that will leverage AI using Gemini Code Assist to accelerate the software development lifecycle. Emphasis also launched a Gen AI blueprint on Microsoft's Azure Marketplace in collaboration with Microsoft and OpenAI. This will help organizations seamlessly integrate and adopt Gen AI solutions to boost efficiency and scale operations. For instance, we've been building Gen AI platform for automating and reimagining complex processes, including reverse engineering, application relearn, and re-engineer, things that have traditionally been manual. Consequently, we have introduced two new platforms as part of our Amphys.ai business unit, modernization and developer experience acceleration. Additionally, we have introduced an AI adoption framework which enables our customers to move beyond POCs and adopt AI within the business. The modernization platform helps in modernization of legacy applications written in languages like COBOL and Java using Gen AI LLMs and LAMs with the objective of reducing the relearning time by over 50%. Building on the foundation laid by the modernization platform, the developer experience platform takes the next step by generating the target state for the modern application, accelerating this phase by 40-50% as well. Moving on to the AI adoption framework, enterprises today are doing lots of POCs but struggling to adopt Gen AI at scale in their businesses. Our comprehensive framework simplifies adoption by bringing people, process, and technology together. We're extremely excited about the capabilities that these platforms and solutions will bring to our customers. Looking back, back at our journey through this past year and where we were versus where we had indicated at the beginning of, beginning of FI24, we entered 2024 with a strong pipeline in cloud transformation and consolidation. Our TCP closures in a challenging year reflected our ability to see pipelines through to deal closure. We had indicated that we would achieve revenue stability in DXC, and to that effect, DXC is now roughly 3% of our revenues. In keeping with our message to drive the non-BFS and the non-US markets growth, we have built strong verticals in healthcare and TMT and continue to consolidate wins in these verticals. The share of our emerging verticals, such as insurance, TMT, logistics, and transportation, and others has increased from 49% to 52% of revenue. In Canada, we started with a set of financial services-focused customers, and we now have a well-diversified clientele across verticals, and we recorded a 42% year-over-year increase in revenues in FY24. We continue to be driven by innovation-led growth and operational excellence for our clients. We invested in our nearshore model and increased headcount by 27% in, in, in regions such as Taiwan, Mexico, Poland, Costa Rica, Canada. Etc. On technology, we made strategic choices to invest in capabilities and skills. In 2024, we were able to quickly acquire and rapidly integrate our AI, Salesforce, and other capabilities with our tribes and archetypes and deliver a more well-rounded suite of services to our customers. Our top 11 to 30 customers ex mortgage grew 13% in FI24 versus the previous year. The large deal wins outside of our top 10 customers grew by 73% in FI24 versus the previous year. Specifically on revenue growth, in April 23, we called out a Q1, Q1 24 softness in the BFS segment, which unfortunately lingered through the first half of the fiscal year. We indicated in April last year that mortgage segment was close to bottoming out and that we expected incremental stability throughout the later part of 24. Though the interest rate environment hasn't changed as we anticipated, the mortgage segment has broadly stayed stable, especially over the recent two to three quarters through FY24. We also indicated that direct is likely to be growth in direct is likely to be back ended with sequential growth starting second half of FY twenty four. And while the growth came in later and slower than expected, however, investments have been in place to drive and capitalize on green shoots as they emerged. We are pleased with our pipeline growth outside of the top ten accounts, which has grown by ten percent year over year, as well as nineteen percent growth in our BFS pipeline. Our proactive deal pipeline is strong, with about 76% of our deals from proactive pursuits. 
A healthy composition of large trees in the pipeline underscores that digital transformation and accelerating digital adoption continue to be core themes for our clients, which are now getting super supercharged by AI adoption as well. Almost all our pipeline continues to be tribe driven, archetype led. Agile ops and platforms. We see AI-enabled opportunities in several of these archetypes, and especially in areas that are opening up new addressable markets for us, such as agile IT ops, next ops, and, and further acceleration in data engineering and modernization. As I mentioned earlier, our pipeline remains strong, and conversion has, conversion has been steady, though still slow, given the impact of seasonality and the macro factors. Large deals continue to show up in our pipeline, and we've also seen an uptick in smaller deals as well, especially in Q4, providing clearer visibility to some revival in discretionary deals, while also boosting the pace of revenue conversion with shorter duration, quick burst deals. We continued with a higher share of proactive deal wins as we stayed focused on deal making in a challenging year. We saw broad-based CCV wins across verticals and, and across the client pyramid with several strategic customers. We closed the year with new TCB wins at $1.38 billion in FI24 and closed deals worth $177 million in Q424. Notably, significant TCB wins continue to be from our beyond top 10 accounts and are well distributed between our various service lines. 77% of our deal wins in this quarter were powered by next gen technology adoption. We saw 15 large deal wins in FI24, including one large deal in Q4, and we remain focused on ramping these to revenue. We are seeing conversion to revenue pace pick up, and our deal archetypes are further strengthened by capability acquisitions made during the year, enabling us to offer a larger breadth of services. We continue to be structurally forward-leaning, making investments where we expect demand. We continue to push for revenue growth, which is anchored in a strong client mining model and tech-led offerings. Our Q4 FY24 revenue came in at US dollars $410.7 million, a growth of 2.1% over previous quarter in constant currency terms. For the full year, we closed FY24 at revenues of $1.61 billion, a decline of 6.5% over previous year in constant currency terms. Direct business accounted for about 95% of our overall revenue in Q4, 24, and for the full year. The mortgage business remained stable this quarter, driven by new deal wins from previous quarters. Our clients continue to look for best-in-breed solution providers for a combination of cost takeout and transformation programs. We expect the pace of revenue and deal conversion to pick up, especially in transformative deals through the remainder of, through the through the coming year. Our direct revenue for the quarter increased by two percent sequentially in CC terms, and by 0.4 percent YOI in Q4 FY24. For the quarter, our anchor geography, the US, improved 2.9 percent sequentially and grew by 0.4 percent in direct YOI in Q4 24. EMEA region also grew on a year-over-year basis. We have been seeing good client wins and continue to see traction there. Our core service line, enterprise apps, constitute about 71% of revenue. We grew 2.8% sequentially in constant currency terms in direct apps. The BPO segment grew 1.8% sequentially and stayed flattish on a YOY basis. We expect this segment to see stability ahead as well. Moving to our vertical performance, as guided in Q3 earnings call, growth was led by BFS and TNT. BFS was up 2.6% sequentially in Q4 and TMT and logistics, logistics were up by 4.5% and 2.2% respectively, driven by client and deal wins in recent quarters. Similarly, our other vertical indirect is growing quite well, as reflected in the 21.6% year-over-year growth in Q4 FY24. We see good ramp-up in new customers added across segments, including in healthcare, in the last few quarters in this segment. Our top 10 accounts declined 10.8% YOY on an LTM basis, mainly impacted by macro conditions, seasonality, and the regional banking issues in the early part of the year. Our top 11 to 20 clients increased by 10.5% YOY, and 21 to 30 client segment grew by 17.3% YOY on an LTM basis. Our new client acquisition revenue continues to grow well, sustaining its strong growth trajectory at 27%. Client mining stats remain steady both sequentially and year over year. Our wallet share with key clients continues to be stable, and we are well positioned with consolidation opportunities and share gains. This is particularly visible in the recovery in growth in BFS in Q4 revenues for us, as well as our pipeline growth in BFS. Coming to our financial metrics, our margin philosophy affords us the flexibility to manage our profitability in the face of revenue headwinds. In this quarter, EBIT margin stood at 14.9%, 
and silver line acquisition costs in fact are margin by 0.8%. Reported operating profit for the quarter declined 1.4% year over year and grew 2.2% sequentially. Losses in cash flow hedges impacted margins in Q4 FY24 by 10 basis points. For the year, our reported margins stood at 15.1%. Our EPS at 20.8 rupees for this quarter represents a growth of 5% sequentially. For the year, our EPS stood at 82.4 rupees, a decline of 5.3% annually. Cash flow generation for, at USD 55 million for the quarter was 116% of net income. Year-to-date cash flow was at about USD 237 million, continuing the trajectory of 100 plus percent of net income and a growth of 56% year over year. Our DSO of 66 days was better by three days over the previous quarter than five days over the previous year. The board of emphasis also recommended a final dividend of dividend of rupees 55 per share to be placed before shareholders for approvals. In summary, we continue to retain our focus on on the micro through FY24 and on ensuring operational stability amidst the duality in the in the macro environment. I'll leave you with a few points on on the summary chart. We continue to focus on building for growth and have made investments for a tech led strategically diversified and transformative growth. We exit FI24 with a resilient pipeline across TCB archetypes, including in our anchor BFS vertical. We grew capabilities through our strategy of build by and partner with the launch of emphasis.ai platform and business unit, continuing strengthening of partnerships ecosystem across hyperscalers, as well as specialist players such as Core.ai and WorkFusion. We also expanded our Salesforce capabilities through the acquisition of Silverline. We continue to diversify our revenue and pipeline beyond BFS and our top 10 clients. We re- revitalized our leadership in core geos, verticals, and technologies, and have expanded our addressable market with new and enhanced capabilities. We're starting to see early signs of PCB to revenue conversion pick up, as reflected in the performance in Q4. FI24 margin stayed expanded to the, to the upper end of the guided band on a normalized basis. Coming in at closer to 16%, towards the second half with our continued focus on productivity and operating levers. We had strong operating cash flows for the year and showed continuous improvement in DSO, with operating cash 56% higher than FY23. Coming to the outlook for FY25, there are a few key messages that I would like you to take away. Firstly, we continue to integrate our capabilities and execute to capture growth opportunities as provided by the new environment, as I mentioned in the previous few minutes. We are also very focused on converting our past and current deal with to revenue. Despite uncertainty in spend and sentiment, FY25 outlook is better than the previous year. We expect that in FY25, we will be at above industry growth with visible gains from tech-led and account-focused strategy, including share gains, consolidation, and continued active mining of clients, especially in the 11 to 30 and the NCA categories. We will continue to execute in areas of growth and invest across capabilities and verticals. On margins, we retain our message of sustainable and steady margins in a narrow band while investing for growth. Our operating margins will remain in in the stated band of 14.6 to 16% in the the upcoming year, with a continued focus on operational rigor, giving us increased confidence on the trajectory of our performance. On that note, moderator, let's open up for questions, please. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Nitin Jain from Fairview Investment Private Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Sorry to interrupt, sir. May I request you to use your handset so your audio is not clear? Yeah, I'm um, speaking from the handset, actually. Yes, sir. It's better now, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, So, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I wanted to dwell a little deeper uh, on the uh, TCB win. So, uh, uh, despite the strong positioning of the company uh, on AI, and uh, the sequential improvement uh, in the BFS uh, BFS industry, uh, the TCV wins have been sequentially declining over the year. So how do we see this uh, trend, you know, uh, going forward? Uh, how are we able to, you know, leverage our positioning in AI in terms of uh, deal wins? 
and uh, uh, the next question is also related to deal with so uh, a lot of industry players have started you know uh, providing numbers uh, in terms of their tcv uh, their ai uh, deal pipeline and uh, AI, uh, revenue generated from ai so would you also be in a position to uh, share any uh, quantitative uh, data thank you sure then i can take the both the questions uh, actually they're pretty pretty uh, linked to each other uh, firstly i think we had a very bunched up uh, early part of the year with some very large deals getting bunched together in in late q1 or late q2 and we guided that we'll have to continue to move deals through the pipeline through the remainder of the year and and that's the reason why the pipeline is up 5% sequentially just q q4 over q3 a uh, large part of the growth came obviously from uh, you know the rebuilding of the pipeline in bfs as we've seen opportunities open up uh, there are two nuances to think about the tcb number one uh, i think uh, the, the on a full year basis we still grown the tcb wins by about 5% in a challenging year second uh, a lot of these deals are you know as we guided especially in the early part of the year were multi year deals uh, have not yet fully ramped up and we continue to monetize the opportunity provided by those deals to ramp up Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind uh, because the linkage between order book and and revenue growth is uh, is much clear, clearer for us given that we only report net new deals uh, secondly uh, in, especially in q4 we've seen uh, a number of short burst deals uh, these are typically uh, you know while we are reporting tcv they are typically even shorter than the acv uh, the duration is even shorter than one year in many of these deals Uh, i think the 0 to 10 million category deals for us the contribution uh, even on a, on a dollar basis is actually very high this quarter and that gives us the ability to ramp up these deals uh, very very uh, you know short you know quickly and hence you've seen some of that already show up in in q4 numbers and we expect that to also show up in in the in the following uh, couple of quarters so i think that's one thing to keep in mind when it comes to the shape and nature of the of the tcv your second question around how we using capability and and how we driving that competitive advantage uh, i think the ability to orchestrate the the tech ecosystem ability to provide a solution that uh, leans on application of tech versus pure capacity or tnm basis i think is is really where the market is headed uh, we have uh, the re- you know we broke out the the overall tcb and we basically said about 28% of that was ai led uh, you know combination of examples i gave you in the uh, in in the presentation uh, are all pointing towards those ai led deals i think it's a little bit too early to start creating a metric that we can report every quarter given that we are heading to a point where almost every archetype every solution will have some element of of tech orchestration but uh, i think we'll continue to work towards figuring out what's the best way to represent growth in that business uh, i mean it's not just us even the hyperscalers are having the same challenge with uh, you know the two earnings calls that i heard listened to today between between google and microsoft i think it's not very easy to to differentiate how much is ai led and how much is uh, is is cloud led so we'll continue to find ways to to give you a representation but for now i think the the take away message is that lead indicators are pipeline pipeline in ai led deals is is directly linked to the four archetypes i talked about which is uh, you know uh, agile it ops uh, next ops data engineering and modernization right those are the four very very uh, large pockets of opportunity and those are the four biggest buckets of our of our pipeline at this point as we speak we do expect the tcv uh, you know conversion rate to to show a, a much healthier number as we as we start at by 25 as well that's quite helpful thank you so much on the uh, on the reporting of the numbers within uh, uh nitin gain we did talk about winning tcb of uh, ai business being one third of our 700 million dollars tcb win uh, and uh, you know wherever relevant we will provide that information uh, at this point in time we are not calling it out separately in the revenue split okay thank you so much thank you the next question is from the line of mohit jain from anand rati please go ahead Yes, sir. One question: uh, In margins, uh, was there some benefit that you guys received uh, during the year uh, from unknown reversal or other things, which is accounted for in EBITDA, or how should we look at it for for Q and for FY24? So, uh, 
uh, Mohit, there are, uh, you know, investments and uh, uh, programs that are created to drive growth. And uh, some of them fructify with, uh, you know, the cost actually getting paid out. And in some cases, you know, since the performance does not match up, those monies don't get paid out. Uh, I mean, there's nothing, uh, you know, which is out of the ordinary from a business as usual perspective. And uh, the reporting had to happen because technically how the accounting works for some of these transactions. But, you know, think of it as, you know, uh, some portion of the incentives that the plan did not get paid out. And, you know, as that got reversed, you know, given our philosophy of puts and takes and investing when there is an opportunity, we found other areas where we could invest it in. So it should not be seen as something which is, you know, uh, either a directionally positive or negative from an EBIT perspective. So we need not adjust EBITDA for the 200 crore kind of figures for that. No, I means there will be, see, a lot of these investments are one time, like we said, right? Short term savings go into short term investments, long term savings go into long term investments. So as that saving accrued, we invested in, uh, you know, uh, equivalent uh, areas. So there is nothing that will upset the guided range. As we would have seen over the last 16 quarters, we have ensured that, you know, we maintain the margin to a stable range and any upside or downside is adjusted through, you know, either dialing up or dialing down the investments. Okay. And second, as a follow-up of the previous, like when should we expect TCB to start growing again? Because that number is coming off quite sharply. Started with 700, now we are below 200. Uh, so what is the expectation there? Yeah, but I think again, as I as I said, right? Yeah, as, as I said, right? Large deals by definition will be lumpy. I think when you consume such a big number, uh, you know, and, and there is a windfall quarter, you will see rebuilding of the pipeline through the phases. And that's what we are focused on. I think on a steady state basis, you know, the LTM average is something we are very, you know, uh, confident that we'll, we'll reach back as we get through FI25. So your LTM average will take us to industry leading growth for FI25. You don't think we need to pull up on TPV? Above industry growth is what we are calling for right now. I didn't say industry leading yet. Uh, you know, if we if we get through the next couple of quarters as as planned and ex expected, then we will definitely. Update that guidance, but at this point in time, what we are saying is, if we get back to, given the nature and 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 uh, duration of some of the deals that we are starting to see, we we do think that if we get back to our LTM average, we should be in a, in a good place for FI25. Thank you, sir. That's all. all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipesh Mehta from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh couple of questions. Uh, starting with uh, medium term, let's say you indicated about increase in TEM by 57, 58 percentage in last three years. If I look at our performance, our revenue growth trajectory will be broadly in line with industry. We are not seeing any benefit from TEM expansion. So if you can help us understand how one should reconcile these two numbers, which you said. Uh, second thing is about the margin range. You indicated fairly yeah, wide range problem. now. Sorry. Yeah. So you indicated fairly wider Sorry, range no, for a bit more. Yeah. Manish, why don't you take the question first, and I'll address the, sure. the three-year sure. revenue question. Yeah. So, uh, Dipesh, uh, you know, as you know, means last year our uh, guidance on the margin was 15.25 to 16.25. And the primary reason why, you know, we maintain that range is because of the uncertainty. Uh, we are, as we speak, at 14.9, while we are guiding to a range of 14.6 to 16. And, uh, you know, the only reason for that is we believe there are some one-timers in this 14.9, like last quarter, and we have called it out specifically. We do believe that as we go forward, we will have opportunities, both from an operating leverage perspective and from... Uh, you know, the perspective of all the uh, productivity and operating levers that we are working on, which should help us further move towards the top end of the margin, other than the fact that some of the impact of acquisitions will get neutralized. However, given the uncertainty, we wanted to make sure that our guidance does not get breached either at the bottom end or the top end, and hence, you know, the guidance of what the normalized margins are. We expect that you know, uh, unless something drastically goes wrong, 
we should be more towards the middle or the top end of the margin range. So, Dipesh, uh, to answer your first question around the three-year revenue growth rate versus TAM expansion, uh, you know, again, off the top of my head, FY22, FY23, and FY24, FY22 direct revenue growth was 36%. Uh, industry revenue growth in that year was in the 16 to 18% range. FY23 direct revenue growth was 14%. Uh, industry growth in that year was in the 6 to 8% range. FY24 direct revenue growth is minus 2.3%. Industry growth probably in the in the 0 to 2% range. If you do a Kager analysis, you will actually see that we probably grew 2x the industry on a three-year Kager basis. So we'll be happy to, to publish these numbers uh, for everyone's benefit. Uh, and by the way, this includes the impact of DR uh, on the mortgage business. Uh, because obviously that included that was included in FR22 and 23 numbers as well. So I think it's uh, uh, if you do the longer range, you know, Kager analysis you do, the better the performance will actually look. Uh, obviously, this performance is getting muted by the impact that we've taken on on two large hits in the last 12 months, uh, mortgage and regional bank. Uh, but I think I'm coming out of out of that, uh, the the Kager the TAM expansion is actually working in our favor as also driven by the large deal wins and the fact that we had a record 15 large deals in FI24. Happy to share more data as, as you wish. Oh, fair point. I have a few follow-ups. Uh, first about, let's say, data-wise, depreciation has inch up sharply this quarter. Whether this would be new normal or there is any one-off in this quarter, which one should be aware of? Second question about if I look at your new gen TC, which was always a focus area for us rather than total TC. Now, new gen TC, if I look on TTM basis, it is showing YOY decline. Uh, so, if you can provide some context to it, what how one should read it. And last is, let's say, vertical wise, if I look at it, if you can provide some sense about how you expect growth trajectory to be led by in FY25, and if any puts and text you would like to highlight across vertical. Thank you. Manish, you want to take the repetition question, and then I can address the, the yes. vertical outlook. Uh, I, I didn't understand yes. the second question, which was around... Uh, the TCV trailing 12 months, maybe. Yeah, okay. New gen TCV, yeah, I'm not referring to total yeah. TCV, new gen. Okay, new gen TCV. So uh, on the depreciation, uh, Dipesh, uh, you know, uh, as you would have seen, the EBITDA expanded from 18 to 18.7%. 18 uh, and uh, while the margin, EBIT margin remained at 14.9, the primary reason for that is some of the savings that we accrued were in the nature of non-cash. And, uh, you know, some of the savings, uh, you know, that one time, the depreciation increase that you are seeing is not normal. You should expect it to be in the range as it was in the prior quarters. Yeah, yeah, I'll take, I'll take the other two. I think the the new gen number in the 75-80% range is kind of the average. Uh, the rest of it is actually comes from organic, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, existing programs get ramped up, ramped down, uh, and hence you will see a, a, a tail of 15-20% that will reflect. I wouldn't read too much into the new gen number. I think as we go forward, as I mentioned, uh, given the tech orchestration, people plus platform play, I, if anything, I think... Uh, that, that will become the primary source of uh, of deal, deal uh, construction and, and deal wins. Uh, on outlook by vertical, I think uh, we we mentioned uh, uh, in uh, the last quarter call that at least for the short term we expect uh, you know growth to be driven by uh, BFS and TNT, and I think that is uh, that is still the case at least in the in the very uh, very short run. Uh, we do think that uh, the worst is behind us uh, Behind us in the logistics uh, business. Travel business already actually been growing well for us between airlines and railroads. Uh, and I think even insurance business has grown well on a YOI basis, and we do have a pretty good view into trajectory for that business. So I think most of the businesses uh, are pointing towards a, a pretty decent picture purely based on the in-account actions and the bottom support that the teams have done across all geographies. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chirag Kachadia from Ashika Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. 
Hi, Nitin. I have one question on uh, margin front. So, the, the margin roadmap which we fill, uh, you know, as an outlook in about 25, have we going to drive that? And uh, what is the our outlook on hiring as well? Yeah. So, I'll take the question on margin. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Chirag, the, you know, constant philosophy for emphasis has been uh, that of investing for growth while maintaining margin in a narrow band. The narrow band, uh, you know, we believe will have a northward bias as the revenue scales, and that is demonstrated in, you know, uh, us continuously increasing the margin delivered on a year-on-year -year basis. Even the range this year, if you see, is, you know, uh, the lower end of the range has gone up. If you normalize for the acquisition, means our... Our reported margin is 14.9. If you take the impact of acquisitions, uh, you know, the new one and the earlier one, uh, adjusted for that, the margin is about 16%. And the range that we have called out will eventually look like 15.7 to 17.1%. Uh, so, and, and most of this is driven by, uh, you know, the, the philosophy that, uh, you know, as and when we have opportunities in terms of, short-term investment capability or long-term investment capability. We really invest in uh, ideas and areas that help us broaden our spider chart, which we presented in the investor deck, which are all the dimensions in which, you know, we, we want to continue investing to prepare the business for the future and for a long-term growth. And, uh, you know, if and when there are some constraints, uh, we have the ability to dial those investments down. So that enables us to ensure that the delivered margin remains in a stable range. And that is how we will continue doing it. And based on what we see today, 14.6 to 16% delivered margin uh, is, is something that we believe we will be able to deliver in the coming years. On the headcount front, I think uh, still a little bit uh, unclear picture as to where the immediate term, you know, discretionary demand will end up. So we are not really you know, building any any large, uh, you know, capacity at this point in time, given that we do have the ability to apply multiple levers, just like you saw in, Q, in Q4. We were able to actually show a pretty decent revenue ramp up. Uh, of course, we ate into some of the utilization and we got the benefits of seasonality back in as well. But I think the, my, at least the short-term view on, on hiring trends is that we will have to really, really be in lockstep with the demand forecast. And we are very focused on, uh, on doing a, a rolling 90-day forecast at this point. Uh, we still obviously have uh, utilization that can further be improved, but at this point, I think we are we are sitting pretty comfortable with the capacity required for us to grow. Uh, and this will really have to be a very dynamic, uh, you know, in-quarter decisions to be made around how much to invest in uh, in ramp-up of capacity. However, a significant investment is already going into upskilling of the people, especially around some of these Gen AI platforms, both internal and third-party platforms. So I think there is a there's a bit of a, of a revolution or evolution going through in the supply chain as well. Uh, supply chain will have to be very much lock, in lockstep and, and uh, in a way kind of highly automated way of, of operating so we can, we can make quick, quick moves with, uh, with, with short, short term, uh, 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 short heads ups. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manik Taneja from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. Just wanted to get your thoughts on... Sorry to interrupt, sir. May I request you to use your handset, sir? Your audio is not clear, sir. Yeah. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. This is better. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on two things. In the past, you've spoken about, from a financial services standpoint, you've spoken about strength on the retail side, strength in wealth management and, and retail banking while pressure in investment banking given uh, given the lack of uh, uh, deal activity. Given what we are seeing in the more recent past in terms of new IPOs coming up in the, in the developed markets, do you think this part of the business segment also starts to do well for us? And if you could provide us some broad context of your split out business of, across some of the industry segments within banking? And the second question was with regards to the org structure or the GTM change that we did uh, last year, 
if you could help us understand where are we in terms of settling down of the of the new gtm structure and also talk about the progress of the new client uh, acquisition led growth good i think on the first one uh, you know interestingly the reference i made to some shorter term quick burst deals uh, is actually a direct reflection of a little bit of the improved uh, you know landscape when it comes to capital markets uh, we've seen some bank earnings and we've seen the impact of uh, you know trading and and uh, capital markets businesses actually surprise on the upside to 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 the street uh, some of that is translating into actions that they're starting to take because the belief is that they that the street is in the early stages of capital markets reopening so i think some of that is definitely good news for the capital market segment uh consumer banking i think a lot of uh, transformation work around experience transformation for customer experience uh the cost take out from operations both business ops and it ops uh, as well as uh sorry uh mr uh, manik uh, may i request you to uh, self mute your line please yes sorry the uh So the capital markets and consumer bank I talked about, asset and wealth is uh, is actually an area of investment because a lot of uh, large firms have have strategically decided to diversify towards asset and wealth given the annuity nature of those businesses. There, I think a lot of work going on around data as well as adoption of Gen AI uh, in the way they think about research and trading as well. So I think the obviously the the consumer lending segment is still a little bit stressed. Uh, the direct linkage of that to mortgage and uh, and auto loans uh, both of those are are either there's not enough volume or the delinquencies are higher so those are actually a little bit of uh, of of hot spots that we haven't yet found a full answer to uh, so that's kind of on the on the you know within the bfs segment uh, what's going on on um, insurance uh, you know since you know bfs i kind of typically talked about i think there is decent uh, demand for modernization solutions across life and annuity players PNC guys are a little bit more class specific stories given the that their own their own internal dynamics are, are very different and the brokers are also very rapidly refreshing uh, their uh, their tech platforms consolidating them and and driving forward so that's the reason why we have started to see some decent uh, activity both in deals and in revenue on the insurance business as well on a wide wide basis the sec- can you repeat the second question my second question was with regards to the is this the second question was org structure gtm yeah gtm structure okay. i think the structure is fully settled uh, monik i think we uh, it's been four quarters now uh, we are starting to reap the benefits of uh, of this uh, go to market account cohorts by vertical in the us uh, that was kind of the only change we made i think our regional structure in europe and, and emerging continues uh i think the the synergy benefit of of having a set of accounts run by the same leadership team Uh, is what is driving our rapid expansion outside of the top 10 accounts and top outside of the top 5 accounts actually uh, i think there is a very interesting set of logos that were acquired in the last 3 years uh, that are actually uh, supercharging uh, you know the overall uh, you know book of business in bfs and that's partly also one of the reasons why uh, we are fairly com- confident about you know the short term pers- prospects uh, in in that business same thing for things like travel and uh, airlines they same a very similar outcome that is being derived through the the, the synergy the syner, synergy that is generated in 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 that unit as well so i think uh, we achieved the objectives that we set out to achieve uh, obviously you know fy24 was a uh, a headwind year for for the industry and for our clients but i think as, as we are we are we are seeing this uptick and recovery in growth uh, i think that that structure will probably become a fairly strong uh, you know go to market pivot for us a pillar for us and not to forget that uh, there is a very strong layer of solutions and tribes that actually cuts across all units all markets uh, all geographies so that continues to to provide that consistency uh, and scalability in the lucky types uh, so i think everything is well is settled in uh, even the you know the the ability to take a new capability and and bundle into a deal archetype is is well uh, established at adar as well sure thank you all the best for the future thank you The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Dalit Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. I uh, hope my lo- line is audible. 
Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so basically, I have a couple of questions. One is to, uh, to you know, I know this is there's no easy answer to this, but just to understand what is the industry growth benchmark for you? Is it more around the Gartner IT services forecast number, or this is more to do with what the average of top 10, 15 players in Indian market may potentially do for this year? That's an easy answer. It's the latter. It's not the Gartner number. It's the it's right. really the, the quote unquote the NASCOM forecast or the or the top twenty player average. Understood. And uh, to to the same point, you know, uh, if we see the uh, number that Gartner is producing uh, for in their forecast looks much better than uh, what NASCOM uh, did last year and what they are expecting now. So is it uh, more to do with uh, you know, corporates investing uh, in AI, um, where probably at this point in the place have less role to play, or maybe some other technology where we have lesser play at this point, which explain the difference of uh, Indian IT growing slower than Gartner, which has never been the case historically. Yeah, I think uh, I would take the Gartner number for what it is. It's a forecast. It is not uh, even in F, into a calendar 23, uh, I don't think uh, there was that level of growth as they forecast. They started the year with a 9% forecast. They ended the year with a 3% forecast. So I think they will revise it based on how the market evolves and develops. Uh, at this point, I do believe, though, that Indian IT is actually going to grow faster than global SIs. You can see that, uh, you know, with, with some of the larger global SIs uh, numbers uh, and, and their forecasts or consensus or guidance for 24. Uh, you'll still see that uh, that that number is actually lower than the the average of the Indian Indian SI growth number, uh, and that has been the case for the last 25 years. I think the value migration in favor of India-centric IT delivery will con is continuing, and and of course the gap has narrowed. It used to be a, a a pretty big gap, but given that the overall industry growth has come off in the last couple of years, that that gap has has of course narrowed. So I think the right way to think about uh, you know the, the growth rate is as we go through the year, where we end up with the forecasts. Of course, that is a line in the sand that we follow because that's a that's a that's a benchmark that gets set at the beginning of the year. Uh, some of that is also, uh, by the way, consumed by the hyperscalers because of their the early consulting services work that needs to get done before it turns into execution deals uh, that actually come to SIs both global and and India. Right, right. And just last bit, <clears throat> uh, since we've been uh, early into this uh, AI theme, uh, is there a way to understand uh, the precise uh, TAM within the, or SAM, within the $40, 50000000000 billion AI market that is defined, uh, which would be more related to the kind of work which we may eventually do? I think the uh, the short answer is that uh, there are wide-ranging forecasts of the size of the AI market, uh, depending on what segment of AI you're talking about. Like there, if you look at machine learning, different estimate, Gen AI, different estimate, conversational AI, different estimate, still very, very early days. I think it's the it's like the 95, 96 time frame with Internet. Uh, I don't think it's anybody has a clear handle. One thing, though, is very clear that things are moving very rapidly. And, uh, uh, and evolution is very fast, at least in the tech landscape. So I don't think it's going to take five years. Uh, within the next couple of years, it'll be pretty clear. The way I see it is, uh, you know, as we as we talked about during the the uh, the commentary that I gave over the presentation, I think there is potential for almost every archetype, every service type, to get enabled by some adoption of tech. Not all of it will be Gen AI, but if you look at something like Agile IT Ops, uh, Production Support, Service Desk, uh, there is a pretty significant, uh, you know, combination of conversational AI and machine learning, pattern recognition, predictive, preventive, self-healing mindset that is actually driving a lot of adoption of, of tech platforms and AI in, in those service lines. So I think to me, uh, just like digital was, you know, in the early days, there was a lot of tagging and re-tagging and redefinition. I think this is a phase we'll have to go through. Painful, but we'll have to go through it over the next few quarters. Uh, and then to me, you know, almost everything you do must be touched by some form of tech. Otherwise, uh, it's going to get completely disrupted or, 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 uh, or it will disappear as a service line. And we've seen that with many, many past service lines. Uh, good one good, really good example is standalone testing. Uh, it's pretty much non-existent today. So I think it's a refresh those, those uh, services. Uh, almost
almost every service type, every tribe, every archetype, and effectively, you know, approach the business as if almost everything will get touched by some element of tech. Now, again, you know, Gen AI is a, is a hype cycle issue, so I'm staying away from saying everything will be Gen AI, but almost everything has the potential of getting converted into a tech play. Understood. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to all participants, ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equiris Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, the first question is in wanted to understand. I think you are the first one to highlight that uh, the small tenure, small size deals are also forming part of the deal pipeline and the deal wins. So is it uh, concentrated with few clients in one vertical or it has been widespread across many verticals? I think it's, uh, I wouldn't say it is concentrated in one vertical, but given the outsized share of BFS for us, I think it's most visible there. And uh, remember, the, you know, banks are almost always power dealing and early adopters of almost all new tech. So some of that is playing in there as well, as they are starting to think about how these, these new tech platforms are going to impact their overall programs. Many of them are already in a journey for cloud migration or transformation. Now this gets gives them another lever to, uh, to not just accelerate the journey, but actually fund that journey. So I think uh, it is more broad-based than just one or two verticals, but at the same time, uh, I think I'm very enthused by the fact that the level of activity in, in BFS, at least for us, is is, uh, is pretty strong right now, and that gives me uh, a certain degree of confidence for, for the short term. Okay, fair enough. And Nitin, is it fair to believe now most of your clients specific issue large accounts across many verticals which has impacted your growth in the last couple of years are largely behind, especially in a top client within your BFS as a vertical? Yeah, I think not commenting on any one particular customer. Uh, I think I did call out when we talked about the vertical outlook. Uh, most of, I wouldn't say all, but most of client-specific issues uh, seem to be, the work seems to be behind us. As capital market activity recovers, I think whatever is left will probably get addressed through that. Then the only thing left to recover will be the interest rate sensitive, sensitive business around mortgage. There I still don't see you know, any pickup in volumes. Uh, I think whatever sustain, sustainable revenue we are, we are generating is being generated through, uh, you know, either the fact that we are a lot more efficient than our clients' operations, or we are actually ch gaining share uh, from some other providers and new customers. So I think it's a, uh, barring that segment, uh, uh, I think the uh, the large account issues seem to be at least seem the worst seems to be behind us. Okay, okay. And just uh, clarity in terms of uh, your earlier comment, F524 TCV is not fully reflected in terms of the conversion into revenues. So do you believe the first quarter F524 TCV, which might not have been converted fully into revenues, may now may not delay going forward and start looking uh, in terms of conversion to revenues in the coming quarters? So despite the fourth quarter TCB being low, one cannot judge the softer revenue growth. It could be uh, a vice versa where earlier quarters uh, deal wins are converting into revenue and the growth could be better. Absolutely. I think uh, I call for that. Uh, it's not just the first quarter TCB. I think, you know, we had 1.38 billion in the last four quarters. A lot of that, you know, we are consuming through. Uh, a lot, you know, uh, some of the earlier deals are still not fully ramped up, uh, and we've been calling calling for that delay happening over two quarters, uh, last two quarters. This quarter, we've seen some pickup in activity, and it's still not fully ramped up. So I think we'll continue to consume what order book we have as we also focus on closing new order book. And last clarification, uh, Manish, just wanted to understand uh, this GNA cost has gone down materially on absolute basis by 24 percentage. Uh, what has led to this, and uh, what would be the normalized run rate? So, Sandeep, uh, you know the the real metric that we kind of track and look for is the EBIT number, and uh, you know when you have some one-time reversals and one-time charges, it may come in different buckets. So, you know, we do have a disclosure that 
there is a reasonable amount of money that we reverse in this quarter a large part of that actually came in as a reduction in the gna cost and in the gross margin line item while the investment that we made corresponding to that saving actually went in sc and uh, gross margin so you would see a reduction in the gna number because of that while the sc looks higher uh, however uh, you know the real way to think about it is a longer term trend and there i think the number is a little higher than the 5% that we reported and uh, you know that is what the normalized margin will look like the normalized gna will look like going forward <clears throat> So 14.9 as a reported margin does not have any one off to call out right way to understand so 14.9 last quarter also we had said that you know uh, there is some bit of uh, upside because of one time and so is the case this quarter uh, and which is why we have guided a lower end of 14.6 however uh, you know the endeavor and the the view is that if things remain you know are uh, stable and we are able to get operating leverage uh, we should be able to deliver 14.9 or or higher so thanks and all the best thank you the next thank question you. is from the line of vibor singhal from nuama equities please go ahead yeah hi uh, thanks for getting my question uh given my question was on uh, bfs direct excluding dr uh what is uh, the i mean uh, it, uh, of course in this quarter it was down 9% by and by as we can see by the plot presentation but i'm sure it was a sequential improvement in the business as we have seen so what is uh, uh, if you could just basically give some idea to what is happening in that uh, segment uh, what are our key trends which we should uh, look at and going forward in the next 2 to 3 quarters how do you see that segment playing out Yeah, I think uh, I actually addressed it uh, in a couple of different ways, uh, both through my comments and through the previous questions. But just to kind of sum it up, uh, the the ability uh, of enterprises to you know look at how they can redesign operations and technology using some of the newer newer capabilities that have been made available in the last 12 months is driving one pocket of conversations and deals. not many of those deals are fully you know super sized yet because somebody will roll out a certain number of of pocs or pilots or or certain teams will actually adopt that first and then they will scale it so that's one pocket of of opening that we are seeing that's why we've been very forward leaning on for example the aws sca around fs in the us with with a foundry approach second uh, i think the ability to for us to create deals Uh, I gave an example of uh, you know a production support COE for a large US bank that was not something that we would have been able to win uh, you know 18 or 24 months ago because that was a scale game per ticket pricing how many you know how many different locations do you have people in uh, you know what's the you know per ticket reduction you can commit over the next 12 24 36 months uh, and how many you know thousands of people are in that operation for you will drive your ability to win that business today that that playing field has been level set because clients not focused or at least our, our approach to the business is to not get the customer to focus on pm per ticket cost but to focus on reduction in overall ticket volume because you can actually automate a lot of that intervention uh, you know by using uh, ai led ops or machine learning combined pattern recognition combined with self healing so that's a completely asymmetric opening of tam uh, i don't know if that is you know uh, that places everybody in the same uh, in the same position the answer is probably not because uh, that market you know by itself is uh, is going to get uh, very heavily uh, disrupted with with automation and and ai ops uh, but that, for us that's definitely adding both to pipeline and to deals and third i think i talked a little bit about green shoots of activity coming out of this uh, you know the short burst deals some of it is linked to the capital markets recovery some of it is just linked to the fact that one quarter into the year uh, i think there is a little bit of change fatigue they didn't really do much last year they have to do a certain number of programs this year question is you know what does the macro do to that spend on a on a 6 9 12 month basis the answer is we don't know we just have to focus on in account action and bottom up uh, you know driving our quality share gains and i think given that we've also added a number of marquee logos in bfs in the last 18 to 24 months 36 months 
that's a massive opportunity for us to, to gain share. So I think it's, it's really a combination of all of these things. None of this is macro dependent for us because, you know, we really can't take a call on that. All of it is dependent on our actions and what we control. And that's what's driving our confidence in the fact that at least for the next, uh, you know, for the first half of the year, we have decent visibility. We'll up update that visibility as we get into the next quarter or, uh, or two, because that will give us a little bit more, more sense of whether the, these green shoots on, on short burst views are sustainable. Got it, got it. But on the demand side, just to uh, uh, wrap it up uh, this last question from my side, on the demand side, uh, I mean, uh, how are the BSSI customers, again, excluding mortgage that I'm talking about, how are the BSSI customers uh, reacting to the uh, interest rate cut scenario being pushed out further and further? Uh, is there any dependency of their, on the on the, on the tech spends on this uh, thing, or do you think uh, they, we are well past that and now tech spends have hit a bottom and from there they should recover? Yeah, I think some of it is kind of just baked into the into the acceptance that higher for longer is here to stay. Question is whether July happens, September happens. I don't know any. I don't think anybody knows. I think at this point, obviously, uh, I mean, you saw the bank earnings. There was very little, you know, to call out there saying higher interest rates are hurting bank earnings. Yes, they're paying more for deposits, but there also names have been expanded, uh, you know, for for the last couple of years. So I think it's a uh, it's in a way kind of a an, a, an uncomfortable equilibrium, so to speak. Uh, question is, you know, can that equilibrium be, be tipped in favor of higher spends? I think it's too early for us to call. That's why we are really, we are really, really focused on in-account actions. Got it. Great. Thank you so much for taking my questions with me. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Nitin Rakesh for closing comments. Again, thank you all for your continued interest and emphasis on your questions. And I know it was early in the morning. Uh, we we are very very pleased with with the way we've uh, we've executed over the last few months. Uh, very focused on continuing to execute, as I mentioned, on a on a bottoms up micro basis. And while the environment stays uh, uncertain, uh, we are cautiously optimistic. Thank you again, and I'll uh, talk to you all in, in the next quarterly call. Thank you. On behalf of Emphasis Limited, that concludes this conference. If you have any further questions, please reach out to Emphasis Investor Relations at investor.relations at emphasis.com. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.